in this session, Grace Lisa Concepcion, uh, who holds a PhD in history from the University of the Philippines de Liman. Uh, she wrote her dissertation on the rise and development of pueblos in Laguna de Bay, um, or a region outside Manila from the late 16th to the mid, 17th, uh, mid 18th century. She is interested in exploring the changes in the social and political dynamics that these emergent spaces brought about and is presently researching indigenous land ownership in the Philippines. Um, I ask Grace Lisa Concepcion to come to the podium. Please. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, I have a title. The title is In the Face of Local and Foreign Enemies, Native Militia of the Philippines in the 18th Century. So. Someone typed, I think, a question in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, where are you? Uh, USB. Where's this? Yeah. I need to find her. Yeah. It's yeah. A USB. It's an USB. Yes. Is it here? Which one? No. It's in the image. It's in the image. Ah, okay. We didn't, we didn't download it. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, thank you, Christina and Christina for organizing this conference. It's a great opportunity to be here in London. Um, first visit to this city, so I'm quite excited uh, in this historic moment. And um, okay, first of all, disclaimer. Pardon, <laughs> pardon errors in my abstract. I have here experts in Philippine history. Um, this is my first foray into 18th century um, history. And again, um, you mentioned that earlier in Jody's talk, the British were sidelined. And I'm going to do that further <laughs> now because I'm going to be uh, talking about a local revolt, um, the Polaris Revolt which is actually just an excuse to talk about the native militia. Yeah, okay, so um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, initially I intended to use the Polaris Revolt as a window to discern the history of the native militia in the Philippines in the 18th century. This takes off from an earlier work on the native militia that in the, in the Laguna province, which I did, uh, but in the 17th century, and also based on preliminary research done by um, my peers, Nicholas C., who is here, and Christy Flannery as well, um, um, where she wrote, quote, the British invasion of the Philippines triggered major rebellions across Luzon as Indios exploited the war to recalibrate the colonial bargain, end of quote. So my presentation will focus on the indigenous Filipinos who were at the center of this rebellion, framing them within an institution that the Spanish empire established the native militia in the Philippines. In this paper, I argue that the Philippine native militia and the leadership positions it afforded Filipinos made the institution both an asset and a liability to the Spanish colony. It was an asset because it provided the Spaniards indigenous arms since the 17th, even the uh, late 16th century, but also a liability because as shown by events in the Polaris uh, revolt, it was used as a bargaining tool by the natives to gain control of the province. It leads us to conclude that by the mid 18th century, the native militia as an institution had been rooted enough to be used by natives as a bargaining chip to gain wins, um, gain privileges for themselves within and prospectively without the colonial regime. In much of the literature about the Spanish military in the 17th and 18th century, there's scarcely any mention of the native militia except that native Filipinos collaborated with Spaniards in their wars and expeditions. In Salinas's Legislación Militar Aplicada al Ejército de Filipinas, published in 1879, the author just wrote that the militia seemed to have been assembled even before the 18th century, but he wasn't really sure and was supposed to be a thorough study on uh, the military history of Spain and the Philippines. However, in Polaris's revolt, 
and even the earlier 17th century revolt in Pangasinan, one of the natives' crucial demands was the permanence of a native militia officer position in their town. So there seemed to be a bit of contrasting perception here. For the natives of Binalatongan, um, the largest town in Pangasinan, the native militia officer post was important. But for Spanish records and even historiography, the significance was just relative. So they like dismissed it. Okay. So um, I'm just wondering if I. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is the brief outline of um, the Polaris Revolt, which happened uh, from 1762 to 1764, um, based on Rosario Mendoza Cortez's work on Pangasinan. Um, she, well, number one, she indicated there that it was a revolt of the Timawa, um, Polaris being an ordinary person and not part of the Principalia. So um, the uprising was due to economic reasons tribute payment, which was a heavy burden for the people of Binalatongan. Um, since it was the largest town in Pangasinan in 1759, and um, even before that, it was a significant, uh, that town was a significant source of tribute and fighting men. Um, so Palaris said uh, no more when they heard about the uh, a capitulation of Manila to the British, they said, okay, so no more tribute. Um, and we want the tribute we have paid reimbursed, okay? Just in case the British ask us to pay tribute, we don't want to run the risk of double payment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so among, th that was one of their major demands. The second, um, they, they had about seven demands. Okay. So number two was the removal of the alcalde mayor and the cabeza de barangay and the teacher. Number three, um, for the Spanish government to refrain from demanding Binalatong and to send four men to guard the jail because they had to periodically deploy men to guard the, uh, the jail. Number four was uh, quite important for our paper to retain the position Maestre de Campo um, in Binalatongan forever. And then number five, to remove the friars if they don't support the rebellion. Um, number six, no one from outside Binalatongan should occupy a post in the Pueblo Tribunal. And number seven, again, the native militia posts, ratify the appointments to officer positions in the native militia of three principalia. So, um, Palaris was a Timawa, but he was asking for the ratification of um, officer positions for three uh, principales. The Maestro de Campo General, um, they, the government should appoint Don Andres Lopez. He was from Binalatongan. Number two, the Teniente or the Lieutenant should be Don Juan Estrada of Calasiao. Um, according to another report, he was also Cabeza de Barangay in Binalatongan. Um, and then number three, the Sargento Mayor, um, Don Domingo Rayo from Lingayen. Okay, so those three, maybe they were friends. Uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, like, uh, or maybe these principales just told Juan Palares, since you have clout, you know, you're at Timawa, and Timawas right now are very popular. As I realized, uh, Diego Silang was also, uh, yeah, it was a more or less a Timawa revolt. So maybe these three, um, asked Polaris, okay, so, you know, like intercede for us. Um, yeah. Now, among Polaris's demands, again, was to retain the baton of the master of camp to in Binalatongan. Um, Binalatongan was not new to revolts. It was the center of Don Andres Malong's uprising in 1660. Um, neither was it new to the native militia for there had been several maestres de campos from that town since the 1660s. Um, okay, so if Palaris indeed was a non-native, non-elite native, his request to have military appointments of his allies ratified could be indicative of the importance that the native officer posts had gained in the preceding years. It could be indicative of the militia's role in the province as holders of power. Um, because then the Spanish camp deemed it important to grant this request. Um, Anda said, 
all the other requests, no, obviously Spanish government can, could not re, um, reimburse the tribute because it was needed by the, by the Spaniards. Um, but yes, they were going to grant the native militia positions. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, so uh, here's just a brief history because I'm looking at Nixie here <laughs> and I'm sure she's gonna cue me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so here's just a brief history of the native militia since its inception in the 17th century. Um, so um, now the reliance on native arms to advance the conquest of the Philippines began as soon as Legazpi arrived in the Philippines. So um, by 1603, just in the eve of the Sangley Revolt, the Spanish Captain General ordered the establishment of native infantry captaincies in the provinces around Manila. Um, I'd say the formalization of the native militia could be dated here. Um, he, so to recruit them to fight the Sangleys, quote, the governor sent out his Sargento Mayor, Don Juan de Arceo, with 200 infantrymen, eight cavalrymen, 100 Pampangos and 400 Tagal Indians, all with firearms and two pieces of cannons. So um, the recruitment of forces was done through friar missionaries who were on the ground and through them, the native elite who brought the men loyal to them to fight for the Spaniards. This type of recruitment using religious and local chiefs networks was used until the 18th century as already uh, mentioned earlier. Um, the British invasion saw priests raising armies, usually through the native elite, to fight against the enemies. Um, so uh, Governor General Pedro de Acuña said, I wrote to the alcaldes mayores and the fathers. They sent me a memorandum of those who appeared to them most fit, saying that they had told them that they should immediately get their people ready and well armed, each one with rations for a month. Okay, so that was uh, how they got men. But then they also um, later on uh, provided this militia some kind of structure. So I based this on the schedule of fees that principales appointed to officer positions paid. Um, these schedule of fees are reported in the financial, the annual financial report of the Royal Hacienda. Um, and these were the, so they divided, I, I'm not sure now if uh, this happened in Pangasinan, but most likely it did. In Laguna, this is what happened. They divided the militia into a provincial command for the province and then sub-provincial command. And then each pueblo fielded men. Um, and these are the officer positions. Um, just for us to know that, well, the native militia was okay for the Spaniards, maybe insignificant, a motley crew of uh, Filipinos, but actually uh, there was some kind of, uh, of structure. So the Maestro de Campo was the leader of each division. Um, and it seems that for the, uh, in the Polaris Revolt, the Maestro de Campo of Binalatongan would be the Maestro de Campo of the whole province. And for them, it was really important. Um, and, oops. And then at the sub-provincial level, um, it was a geographic, it was some, um, depending on the geography of the province or the size of the province, there would also be a command, a smaller command of um, a group of pueblos that would um, uh, make up a sub-provincial command. And then at the Pueblo level, you have officers um, officer posts being replicated as well. So each pueblo would have a maestro de campo, a teniente, um, sargento mayor, capitán y cabo, alferes de la compañía, and the ayudante del sargento mayor and sargento de la compañía. Okay. So um, each of them paid uh, different, uh, there was a schedule of fees. The maestro de campo would pay a fee of 30 pesos um, to the government. It was like a tax, not the tribute, 
but it was uh, called the media anata tax, a special tax for uh, any kind of benefit um, that you gained from the Spanish government or any position that you occupied. Um, so all these positions were in theory occupied by uh, Principalia. Just going to remove that. It, it's sharing the wrong thing. So. Is it? Yeah, so it should be there. small. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the Maestro de Campo, Nicolas C., uh, my oh. colleague here, <laughs> what a coincidence, um, who fixed the PowerPoint, um, has written about the figure of the Master of Camp in his paper entitled The Maestro de Campo General of Pangasinan, Jefe Superior of All the Municipalities, 1592-1762. Um, if you want more details on the position of the Maestro de Campo. Um, but I'll just add a few words to... Um, so just to uh, complement what he has written. In Laguna, for instance, where I first looked into the native militia, the Maestro de Campo General post was usually held by a, a large community, just like Binalatongan, but it was not necessarily the capital of the province. Um, so in, in Laguna, that position was held by a town called Lumban. I, I don't know if any one of you here among the Filipinos have heard of Lumban. Maybe you have, but uh, right, of course, Enrique <laughs> Jose is here. And... Uh, the most number of tribute. So it's like a parallel to Binalatongan. Um, Binalatongan, as far as I know, was not uh, the capital of, Pang was never the capital of Pangasinan, I think. Um, uh, but maybe my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong. Mm, both Lumban and Binalatongan were old towns founded in the 17th century. And, the, um, and so it had like um, maybe more alliance with uh, the Spanish, more engagement with the friars, um, and maybe more formalized colonial institutions. Okay. Now, um, okay, so uh, I'll just... Um, now, what about the Sangley involvement in the militia? The Chinese mestizo involvement in the militia must have begun in 1656 with Governor General Sabiniano Manrique de Lara's order issued to the Alcaldes Mayores of Tondo, Bulacan, and Balayan to draft padrones of mestizos de Sangley in their respective provinces and form companies of infantry with them. So the Sangleys were also involved here. Um, and they basically had the same um, officer positions and they paid the media anata as well. Um, so it seems that the 17th century militia structure that you can see here was still in use when the British invaded Manila. These native militia of different provinces that were loyal to the Spaniards fought with Anda against the British and also against uh, Palaris and Silang. Um, at the arrival of the British, the artillery consisted in Manila, the artillery consisted of 80 men, um, about 500 men for the defense of Manila, mostly Mexicans and 100 native Filipinos. Um, but that number increased as the native provincial militias joined forces. However, according to an Augustinian account, though several troops of 5,000 fighting Filipinos were assembled, they hardly knew how to use firearms. So again, that contrast of um, the, in Spanish accounts, dismissing the importance of the native militias, but at the same time, in, um, based on native demands, it seems that it was important for them. Um, so just some changes in the military in the 18th century. Details are spotty, but we know that the master of camp title had been replaced, according to 
Hobie, uh, Nicholas C., quote, by the 1750s, the colonial military replaced both the title and the tercio with French military models. So the Maestro de Campo was scrapped and this uh, structure was uh, modified. Yet Polaris in the 1760s was adamant that um, the Maestro de Campo should be retained in their town. Um, sources are not so clear when, the, uh, when reforms really took place, um, but there was a move to create more militia companies in Pampanga, Batangas, Bulacan, Bataan, Laguna, and Cavite because of the looming British attack before uh, 1762. These forces, after the British uh, invasion, these forces returned to their provinces uh, when the British threat disappeared um, in 1781. After the British occupation of Manila, the Spanish government adopted measures to reform the military, including the provincial militias, the officer posts, and recruitment. Um, from 1769, the head of the militia became the colonel. The maestro de campo was no longer included in the list of officers. However, the title continued to be given to indigenous leaders as an honorific up to the early 19th century. Um, so just some insights to conclude. Um, the details on the native militia have largely been overlooked in Spanish chronicles. Some Spanish accounts in the 17th century observed that the natives were undisciplined, hardly trained, unable to address Spanish needs to secure the Philippines. However, in the minds of the rebels from Binalatong and posts in the native militia were significant, for they used it as a bargaining chip in their negotiation with the Spanish government. Among Polaris's demand, the ratification of the native militia post was granted by ANDA. Um, the return of the tribute paid was not granted, but perhaps and the hope that with the power of the native militia post ensured, Polaris's camp would have been pacified. Um, the foregoing discussion that the, for, the foregoing shows that although Spanish accounts might have dismissed the role of the militia as secondary, perhaps native perception of that role was not so. The fact that Polaris and Malong before him demanded the power and influence of the Maestro de Campos to, to stay in Benilatongan town leads us to think about the significance of the native militia in local life. Perhaps by looking at the native militia and the post of the Maestro de Campo, where they were from, which towns fielded the largest numbers of officers, we can learn more about the early history, social and political dynamics in the provinces. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, 